Every day it's war on the television. A ruthless war. But a just war. A war to save us. We, the consumers, the victims of the crisis. The price war, a struggle without mercy. Where the symbols of one supermarket chain crusade for cheaper prices. We keep the expenses down at Intermarché. We're united against high prices. The Leclerc tanks attack Carrefour, who blow up Casino and force the brave soldiers of the discount to their knees. Do you know how much cheaper light fresh cream is at Leclerc than at Lidl or Ed, for example? The lower the price, the greater the victory. If you consider the slogans that are used in the commercials, you might think the conflict revolves around a new philosophy of life. Live better, spend less. You heard right. Live better, spend less. Lower prices and more trust. Trust, that's a powerful word. Trust in what, actually? Oh yeah, uh, the quality of their products, respect for the environment, not for people. All supermarkets have their virtues. So follow us, don't be scared. The consumerist miracle is just as unlikely as this food has come from the four corners of the world. A globalized dish. It's the famous Christmas tomato, the strawberry you can buy in January, the Spanish cucumber, and Scottish salmon from Chile. Not expensive, but cheaper and responsible. Everyone comes here. Really? More now on the scandal of frozen food meals containing horse meat. You remember, surely. Findus, Spangero, Picar. Romania, horse meat in the lasagna? You might have already forgotten that news, but it got to the heart of the matter. It's a Dutch broker based in Cyprus who negotiated the purchase of horse meat from a Romanian slaughterhouse. In the price war, it's the traders that buy and sell meat. Like petrol or gas, food has become a speculative commodity. It's the final stage where prices can be squeezed. Cheap beef, and if it's horse, well, that's fine. Society, in fact, considers it has a right to cheap food at low prices. And from that point, it's the workforce that becomes the adjustment variable. So you need a workforce that can be exploited at will. It's the workforce that pays for the low prices. The men and women you don't see. The people in Europe and elsewhere that feed us. Who do they belong to? Those hands that gather, pick and dispatch. Those hands must have a face. The face of modern slavery and human exploitation. The abuse is hidden behind the main fruits and vegetables we consume every day in all seasons. Tomatoes, for example. You buy them fresh, in meat sauces, in ready-made meals, as a juice, Concentrated, conserved in tins, such as whole peeled tomatoes. Branded, Auchan, Carrefour, or sometimes labeled simply tomatoes. 70% of cheap tin tomatoes come from Italy. In particular, the area around Foggia in Puglia, in the south of Italy. Now, according to its tourist office, it's an area that's full of promise. A night in the luxurious villa, belonging to this old lady who will prepare you a meal. You can easily cycle round the whole area, even the hills, for the day. Here, you're the king of the road. In the big city, you'd get a fine, but here, you can drive with your feet. Visit the old town at Castel del Monte, flanked by the bright blue sea up hills and down dales to a small church where picturesque and generous locals invite you to their wedding. It's paradise. But when we went to visit, we were a little disappointed. We're near Foggia, 
But this area is what the locals called a grand ghetto, in the middle of the tomato fields. It's October and at the end of the season. From spring to autumn, between 1,500 and 3,000 migrant workers live here. All of them pick the tomatoes. It's not easy to enter the slum. Senegalese, Malians, Ivorians, most are from West Africa and are ashamed of their living conditions and don't want to be filmed. Isouf finally does agree to talk. Age 29 is from the Ivory Coast. It's seven in the morning, almost too late to head off to work. We're working close by here today. It's just 20, 30 minutes away. Uh, that's why I'm still here. Otherwise, I'd have gone at four in the morning. The tomatoes are finished for this year. Isouf is now picking olives, fennel or broccoli. To be able to live in the Grand Ghetto and set up your hut, you need to pay at least 100 euros each season to the landowner. Uh, this is where we're sleeping at the moment. This is the first blanket, the second, and the third. Uh, it's cold, and the cardboard huts don't, don't really keep us warm at all. A plywood framework. Walls made from cardboard and plastic as insulation. And opposite Isouf's hut, welcome to the canteen. This is where we can cook and where we heat the water for, for when we wash. In the cupboard there are a few vegetables, but not even one can of tomatoes. That's the sugar, but it's got a bit hard, you see? Look, it was powdered, but now it's frozen. Because it's too cold? Oh, yeah. I never expected these problems coming to Italy. I never thought you'd find such terrible living conditions and hardships here. Because even in Africa, it's rare to see this sort of thing. You mean as, as bad as here? Yes. The big ghetto here is worse than what you left behind in Africa? Yes. And if you need convincing, take a look at the sanitary block. Here are the showers. That's where we wash. But only if you bring your bucket. The regional authorities provide the water. This isn't La Dolce Vita, it's Foggia, in the heart of the European Union. We continue our special tour of Puglia. There seem to be half-ruined houses everywhere. These are the casolari. This is where the agricultural equipment is usually kept. But on closer inspection, it's now where many migrant workers have set up shelter. How many are there subsisting in the middle of the fields in Italy? There are few reliable statistics. But we did get hold of a report by one of the country's main farming unions. The study, published in 2012 and conducted alongside researchers from the University of Milan and Italian state prosecutors, found an estimated 400,000 illegal workers in the agricultural sector. In Foggia, the trade unionists suggest we cover a very rare event indeed. Two seasonal workers from Morocco are filing suit against their boss. What is your problem? The problem is they paid me nothing. We worked for nothing. When I asked him for money, he told me, wait, we'll, we'll see about that later. 
tomorrow, the next day, the week after. Uh, what time did you begin work and, and what time did you finish work? And we used to start at 7 o'clock in the morning. Uh, then we had a 30-minute break at 1 p.m. for lunch and then finished at 4.30 or 5. Nine hours of harvesting a day. Nassim and Abdel worked for three months for Defeo, a large agricultural firm. They were paid 310 euros each, but Defeo owed more than four times that. They took some photos of themselves during the harvest, but they prefer to remain anonymous, as one of them doesn't have working papers. So who paid the wages? The corporal, the, the, the team leader. A corporal? Well, what's this about a corporal? The employer, the Italian owner, leaves it to these corporals. They go round looking for workers. They say, who wants to come and work? The pickers don't usually know which boss they'll be working for. They don't know how much they'll be paid. And they don't even know the hours they'll do. They have no dealings directly with the owner, just with the corporals. A corporal, like in the army. In the fields, in fact, it is a military-like organization. It's known as the caporalato system, which has existed for centuries throughout southern Italy's farming sector. No corporal, no work. Adam is from Burkina Faso. In 2011, he was picking tomatoes near Lecce in Puglia. Last year at Nardo, uh, there were 60 of us. But there were just contracts for 20. The others were moonlighting and for much less money. We found out the usual rate was 10 euros an hour, but we were only getting four. Four euros for packing a case of tomatoes that weighs 300 kilos, picked in one hour, and every time the corporal takes his cut. Adam secretly filmed the harvest with his mobile phone. The only white man in the video is the corporal. He's taking roll call. Adam, nice. He's the taskmaster, the one who pays the workers and transports the troops. Eight crammed into a small van. It's not charity, it's profitability, as the corporal charges for all his services. According to the union report, 100,000 workers in Italy are victims of this form of extortion. For a long time, the authorities turned a blind eye. But Valeria Mignone is one of the first magistrates to take some action. To me, it's, it's modern slavery. In fact, the Geneva Convention compares this form of exploitation to slavery. The only contacts the workers have with the outside world are these corporals. They pay exorbitant prices for their water. A small sandwich costs them between two and five euros. And they have to buy everything through the corporal. They're not allowed to get it any other way. They also need to pay the corporal for their accommodation, even if it's run down and unhygienic and out in the suburbs. Last year, the state prosecutor broke up a network of human trafficking organized by the corporals. The video comes from the Italian police, as it discovers this immigrant workers' camp near Nardo, in the southern tip of Puglia. Men sleeping on the tarpaulins, or just in the rough. A two-year inquiry involving phone tapping, when one morning, bingo, an Italian special ops police raid makes a huge bust. Intermediaries, Corporals, traffickers, farming bosses. Altogether, 22 people are arrested. But the number of victims may never be known. Certainly hundreds of North Africans, Ghanaians, Senegalese, and Sudanese. 
The immigrants would deal with a trafficker, paying him around 3,000 to 3,500 euros for the journey. They'd be promised a well-paid job and working papers, of course. They'd arrive in Italy convinced they were there legally, having sometimes got into debt for that. But of course, everything was fake. Without legal employment, without papers, the immigrants are at the mercy of the network and can be exploited at will. Prosecutor Mignone orders the phone tapping of the suspected leaders for three months. In this recording, two farmers are referring to the immigrants as they would pack animals. Now this lot I'll wear out to the end of the day, like animals. So keep a fresh team for me, will you? And I'll see if they can do four or five hundred kilos. Understood? Okay. As for the women field workers, you can just imagine how they're treated. How many women do you need for the warehouse? Eleven, twelve? We'll take two women with us. They'll work in the warehouse some of the time, and the other time they'll work at night. Know what I mean? One network may have been dismantled, but how many others still exist in southern Italy? <laughs> Tomatoes, watermelons, broccoli, grapes, all fruits and vegetables that sell well in Europe's supermarkets and produced by thousands of immigrant workers in almost slave-like conditions. With a little perseverance, it's possible to find out who's footing the social costs in these networks. But there's one product where the bill is even more expensive. And that's fish. At sea, there are no witnesses, no police, no unions and the exploitation goes much, much further. We'll tell you about these people, effectively slaves, alone, out in the middle of the ocean. But to try and do so, you need to get up early, at three o'clock in the morning. Grangis, near Paris, is the largest fresh produce market in the world. Building B4 is where the catch of the day can be found. 170,000 tons of seafood is handled here every year. In theory, you'd think these wholesalers are experts on fish. They know the names and surnames of each species, and of course, where they come from. But we were somewhat disillusioned. To get to the truth, we used a hidden camera. I don't care where they come from. What matters are that I can sell them. Hello, how are you? Listen, I have a question about the prawns. Uh, well, what's this, for example? Oh, those are great. It's, uh, they're wild. They're from the Indian Ocean. The Indian Ocean? Because I was, I was looking just now, and it said East Central Atlantic. That one? East Central Atlantic. But isn't Madagascar in the Indian Ocean? Oh, is this from Madagascar? Yes, on the box, East Central Atlantic is clearly marked. Funny how you forget your geography lessons from school. The East Central Atlantic is here. Among those who've given the matter some consideration is the environmental NGO that's built a reputation for its shock tactics out at sea, Greenpeace. The man in charge of Greenpeace's fishing policy in France is blind. Yet he's able to keep an eye on the living conditions of all those slaves on the ocean. When you work on the industrial fishing sector, uh, whether it's environmental issues or social issues, you wonder about the working conditions. And what you soon discover is that it is very much like slavery. The conditions have been made known, but unfortunately they're more common than most people think. And it's for an industry that supplies the fish that we eat here. Take Guinea, a small West African nation with a large seafront and a strong maritime culture. Conakry is the capital. The artisan fishermen of the port of Bulbine set off every day into some of the richest fishing waters in the world. But competition is tough. 
Asian and European factory ships come to fish off the coast of Guinea, sometimes completely unlawfully. A 12-mile stretch of water is reserved for the small local fishing fleet, and the factory ships are banned. But some still cast their nets just a few hundred meters offshore where the fish are most plentiful. And in order to pillage these seas for a maximum profit, they flaunt maritime law, as they do human rights. EJF, a British NGO, has attacked these practices. In its latest report on illegal fishing in West Africa, the organization lists the abuses and bad conditions that thousands of sailors are subjected to on board Korean and Chinese fishing boats. It filmed these scenes in 2006. This is a Chinese trawler. It could do with a lick of paint. But inside, this is where the fish is processed. And these are the fishermen's cabins. Very comfortable. land and in a suburb of Conakry, one hour from the port, we meet up with a sailor who went through hell on board ship. <laughs> Aliseni, age 38, works on the factory ships. It's not something he chooses, but he has a family of 12 to feed. <laughs> I've been on more than a dozen Chinese ships. It's the same thing in all of them. It's hard work, day and night. No Sundays off, no days off. And if you take a break, they just cancel your contract. On his last journey, he and his colleagues worked relentlessly for the 28 days they were out at sea. On the last day, after 24 hours without sleep and exhausted, he decided to have a rest. I refused to work. I went to my cabin to have a rest. My, my boss came to get me and he warned me that they were going to beat me. The Chinese were going to beat me. They're often aggressive like that. They beat us with iron bars. That's how they keep control. And all that for a miserable salary. You only earn $200. What can you do with that? Look, look at all the children. I have 12 people to take care of. $200 a month, no pauses, no weekends, no breaks. We go to see the Guinea Fishermen's Union to find out more about life on the factory ships and listen to more eyewitness accounts. Frank Tunkara no longer goes out to sea. These days, he manages the fishermen's union. He's in charge of the accounts and also registers complaints from members. These are all the statements uh, that have been taken about, about disputes and litigations uh, that are often made when the sailors come back from sea. So seven, eight, nine... Uh, there were 18 complaints in 2011. No toilets, no rest, too many fights, bad treatment. And one sailor mentions how one of his friend's body had been found in the fishing nets after his corpse had been thrown overboard, and so on and so forth for page after page, each time the abuse takes place on South Korean or Chinese factory ships. We sleep on cardboard boxes among the cockroaches and rats. The living conditions are terrible. The pay is terrible. Everything is terrible, my brother. It is very difficult to get aboard one of these Asian ships on the high seas. And after a few vain attempts, the Guinean military agrees to take us out. It's odd, but in Africa there always seems to be a French soldier somewhere in the vicinity. Man your posts. Clear the gangway. Come on, man your posts. In front of the cameras, the Guinean authorities want to show us that it's acting. Casting off in fine style. A good wind, and pirates who'd better behave themselves. The 
Our enemies don't sleep, so we mustn't sleep either. It's the reason we have a navy. Well, all right, we shouldn't really be making fun. But if we do, it's because the Guinean authorities are laying on all of this just for the cameras. The truth is, they've done very little to stop any abuses up to now. After two hours at sea, we spot a Korean trawler. It stopped, and well inside Guinean territorial waters. It's meant to be a no-go area for the factory ships. We set off. Once we're on board, the inspectors from the fishing ministry carry out some controls. To begin with, the South Korean captain claims he's got engine trouble. That explains his presence close to the shoreline in the no fishing zone. We make the most of the situation and go look for the crew below decks. Whose cabin is this? Uh, one of the Africans. This is where the Africans live. Okay. Eight sailors sleep here in barely five square meters. Okay. Come on. Come on. Here's the kitchen. First sight, it doesn't seem quite as bad as on some other vessels, but it's still a long way from modern European and even South Korean standards. Korean boats are no good. I don't like them. Why? What happens? Well, the wages aren't enough. Well, how much do you get? $170. Is that good for you or not? No, it's not much. And there's no papers, no contract. Is this where they work? Can we go down and have a look? We don't have much time and we go down into the hold. We have just a few minutes, but it's enough to see what's fished here off the coast of Guinea is packaged to make it seem it's from Korean waters. A nice sleight of hand. Because since 2007, Guinea no longer has the right to export its fish to Europe for sanitary reasons. There aren't the necessary facilities on land to ensure the fish stays fresh, as well as too many incidents of corruption among the authorities to guarantee the proper controls on the fishing boats out at sea. The fish caught here shouldn't make it to Europe, so its nationality is changed. We asked the captain where he hopes to send his real fake Korean fish. Fish here, Euro. How do you send it to Europe? Fish, how does it go to Europe? Euro, Euro. Uh -huh. uh, that's Spain. That's Spain. That's Spain. Ah, Las Palmas. Yeah, yeah. Las Palmas. Ah, OK. On the box, the stamp, Corf 181. It means it's EU approved and authorizes the Korean boat to deliver its fish to Europe. Getting Guinean fish into Europe is a tried and tested procedure. Refrigerator ships come to pick up the cargo that's often been caught illegally close to the coast. It's known as transshipment and it's also illegal. The refrigerator ships set off immediately to the Spanish port of Las Palmas in the Canaries and a port of entry to the European Union. Here we are. Las Palmas, the Canaries, and part of Spain. We notice an official chart from the port authorities. It shows the comings and goings of three refrigerator ships in 2012 between West Africa and Las Palmas. By our reckoning, they would have delivered at least 35,000 tons of fake Asian fish to these warehouses. Lian Run and Haifeng, both Chinese ships, and the Seta 73, Korean. After double checking, the Seta 73 is the ship that takes the fish caught by the factory ship we'd boarded off Guinea and imports it to Europe. It's written here, in the Spanish customs documents from Las Palmas. The customs official has no problem with the fish. It's Korean, and that's it. Isn't it a problem that it's marked Korea? No, the origin is Korea. For a customs official, the fish has been caught in international waters. So the origin is the same as the boat. So you have no way of knowing if it comes from Guinea. 
No, I can't tell that, uh, but there's a document that states the fishing was checked. So for us, it's, it's legal. Can you tell me who buys this fish? I'll need to get some statistics. Uh, but anyway, the, the law forbids me from giving you the name of a buyer of a specific cargo of fish. And that's how the European Union allows fake Asian fish, of which it knows neither the origin nor the conditions in which it was caught, into its territory. And it won't tell us where it's going either. Maria Damanaki, you are the EU Commissioner responsible for maritime affairs and fisheries. Can you guarantee consumers the quality and origin of the fish that is sold in Europe? No, this is something I cannot guarantee. Why? Because uh, though we are... I cannot guarantee ah. that everything is fished illegally. Well, that's awkward for the customer. Oui, oui. Some people perhaps think that uh, fishing illegal is not a big issue, but it is. 10%, 10 billion a year worldwide is the value of the fish which is caught illegally. 10 billion. Can you imagine? We can say that we are improving, but we are not 100% sure that everything that comes to our plate is fished in a legal way. Now, we went to Las Palmas and the Canaries, and there was fish there that was caught off Guinea. Imports from there have been banned since 2007, and it's clearly written in your department notes here. The boats then transship their loads onto Korean or Chinese ships, and they sail into Las Palmas, uh, which is a, a, a gateway to Europe. The fish is a transshipment, we all end up eating it, and nothing happens. You understand that? Palmas in the port, they have to check it. It's not as simple. Everybody who is coming in Las Palmas cannot land what they are fishing. If this happens... But they do check. They do check. Well, we cannot be everywhere, so we have to work with our member states together. So I don't want to blame, to put the blame on somebody else. We have the responsibility. Think we cannot do this alone. Mm -hmm. This is an international scourge. How many people do you, ha do you think we have in all this exercise? How many people? Can you imagine as a European Commission? Well, how many? Tell us. Well, around uh, 20, all of them. So. 20 people to control all the fish that's arriving in Europe? I can give a promise. Before the end of my mandate, I mean, during the next year, this, the legislation will be in place. Now, how did that ad go? Lower prices, more trust. That's right, trust. Suddenly, we're having doubts about the labels on the cans of fish. Maybe now you'll understand why we journalists sometimes have to go shopping with a secret camera. Supermarket signs means we don't often have to rummage about on the shelves to find what we're looking for. All the wonderful products are well presented and well lit, and sometimes prevent us from seeing the important things. Like exploitation of the workforce, and from there it's sometimes a short step to exploitation of an entire region. Take the banana. We eat it all year round. On average, eight and a half kilos a person in France. And often sold very cheaply indeed. It comes from the French West Indies, from Latin America or from Africa. One out of ten bananas sold in France comes from Cameroon. Go on, admit it. You never look at the little stickers, do you? This one says Booba. The banana is also sold under the name SCB. Two clicks and we come across a video from a group that gathers consumer opinions and then attributes an annual Flavor of the Year award. Certainly it's not a prize for a sense of humour. I wanted to ask you how you were. And I wanted to tell you, I have the banana, and I know you want it. Well, we're talking about bananas today, in fact, with the SCB Premium Banana from the fruit company's own plantations in Africa. It's pampered on its entire journey, all the way to the customer's table. It's wonderful yellow-orange colour, and, and this banana is handpicked from the exceptional climate and soil of these African countries, Ivory Coast, Cameroon and Ghana, where it gets its character and intense flavour. Whoa, it makes you want to leave for Africa straight away, and Cameroon in particular. 
that's where the Fruit Company, a French multinational that produces the banana, bought 4,500 hectares in 1991. PHP, the Haute Penjas Company, stretches over 4,700 hectares. In this corporate video, the Fruit Company outlines its activities. Wonderful landscapes, wonderful fruits, a radiant workforce. Owner of its own plantations, the fruit company has been able to set up an environmental policy based on well-thought-out farming methods, the protection of nature and the reduction of its environmental impact. Given all this, it's obvious that when we call the fruit company's director of communications to get permission to film, he and they will welcome us with open arms. Oh no, well, listen, we're perfectly happy with what we're doing. It's just that we don't want to be compared with people who don't share the same vision of this business. But we have done many. Uh, we do do many, as you can see on our website. We just don't want to get into anything controversial. Controversial? No permission to film? Well, that's just making us more interested. Flitting about on the internet, we find an extract of a report drawn up by Fadena, a Cameroonian NGO, in 2010. For three years, and with the support of the United Nations, Fadena states it had studied the impact on the environment and health of the use of pesticides in the region where the fruit company operates. Only a resume of the report is available, but has the link between chemical products and a number of illnesses among the local population been properly established? The main illnesses linked to the use of pesticides in the region have been identified. The results are available in one country, Cameroon. And we told you about not trusting appearances. When we get to Yaoundé, the capital of Cameroon, there's a snag. Fadena doesn't seem to have an address. In fact, the NGO doesn't exist anymore. We did have a phone number, however. Hello? Hello. Hello, is that the Fadena NGO? Go ahead. Listen, we'd like to meet you. Where can we find you? Listen, listen, we don't, we don't have the study any longer. Okay. Well, who has it then? You're speaking to me, but I don't even know your name. What is your name, please? My name is not important. <laughs> Our contact sounds a little ill at ease. In the event, he advises we talk to the UNDP, the United Nations Development Program, the UN agency that co-financed the report we're looking for. The UNDP is our last hope in finding the evidence that pesticides are causing the pollution. In case we miss anything, we keep filming in secret. I've seen so many people, but uh, given the sensitive nature of the information, uh, we're not allowed to give it out to the general public. I mean, personally, I don't know what is in the document. Yet another document that's too sensitive. The UNDP official allows us to read the internal instructions concerning the scientific report we're looking for. We cannot allow this information, which concerns human health, the quality of the soil, the water and the air in the area, the study focused on, to reach the general public. No point in insisting. The Fadena study is no longer here. It's been hidden from prying eyes. So there's no way to find out more about an eventual link between the use of pesticides and illnesses among the people living near the banana plantations in the Njombe Penja region. The area is a stronghold of PHP, the Cameroonian subsidiary of the fruit company. To talk about pesticides that are used in the plantation, we meet up with someone who still works for PHP and who prefers to remain anonymous. As we drive through the plantation, we give him a list of chemicals used to boost plant growth that have now been banned in France. To start with, these are fungicides. Do you use any of them? Yes, we use Bravo 720 SC. Bravo was withdrawn from the French market in 2010 as being potentially carcinogenic. 
Zitan causes irritation to respiratory passages and was removed in 2007. Manzat, Manzat 75, 75, we still use that. Manzat 75 was also withdrawn in 2007 and it also irritates respiratory passages and pollutes water. Siganex. Siganex has not been sold in France since the year 2000. Its toxic effects are still uncertain. You realize that all of these products that have been banned in France, and, and some eh, for many years, that's, well, that's not right, is it? Well, it's no longer used in France because it was estimated to be a health hazard. These pesticides are still permitted in Cameroon. According to our witness, PHP uses them on their plantations. On its internet site, the company claims it respects the laws of Cameroon, France and the EU. What the locals are particularly unhappy about are the methods used to spray these chemical products, not just on the ground, but also by plane, crop dusting, as this recent video shows. In the heart of the plantation, we meet up with two experts on pesticides. They've worked for a number of years for PHP. They too prefer to remain anonymous. So when the plane sprays the product, the wind takes it and, and some of it falls onto the local population. There are deposits, and when the plane passes overhead, uh, everyone gets a load on their body, their skin, and, and all over. The name of one village in the plantation where the inhabitants complain of regularly being sprayed by the crop dusters is Buba. It's the same name given to the banana that's for sale in Europe's supermarkets. The house is very close to the, to to the, the, to, to the bananas. Yeah. When they pump, we, we always suffer of, of uh, the medicine. They come into the into the camp. So as we are, we don't have any means, we only manage with them. Uh -huh. Chemicals. The chemicals come into the camp. The cocoa, the chemical gets on the cocoa. Okay, I mean it's is it, which it, means it poison even the cocoa. Okay. Yes. And do do they warn you when when they're gonna come and and pour the the chemicals? No. Is there warnings? They do not warn us uh, when it comes. Mm -hmm. We already we know it. We enter uh -huh. us into the house and we lock close our houses. Uh, you have to close everything when, when it comes. They, when they are springs. The crop dusters fly twice a month and can harm the locals living close to the plantations. And there's more. The inhabitants in the small town of Injombe Penja have experienced toxic rain. Fifteen years ago, Guy Merlin and some friends were visiting the local market in the town. The plane passed over and everyone got wet. We spent four days in hospital to get treated. And when we left, we had problems with our eyes. I had problems with my eyes and they sent me to an ophthalmologist. I asked for money from the company to pay for my medical expenses. They refused and I had to pay out of my own pocket. But the use of pesticides harms the workers in the plantation itself even more. Not when the plane flies over necessarily, but just afterwards when the chemicals are on the leaves. This elderly gentleman with a glassy stare worked on the plantation for 30 years. It's when he was trimming the leaves that the powder got into his eye. He was taken to hospital and later he lost his eyesight. The boss did nothing about it. So he never received any compensation? No, not a cent. The banana helps us, but it can also destroy us. It's, it's a poison chalice. It's no good for us. It's not the only such case. And we set off to meet another PHP plantation worker who was also blind. Christophe Nguer began picking bananas when he was a teenager. The pesticides cost him his eyesight, and they also cost him his job. When you were working in the plantation, what were the safety measures like? There were no safety regulations or measures. There was no equipment. The product would choke us, but we didn't take it seriously. 
Mais comme on était mineux là, qu'on était dans la naïveté là, on prenait ça comme ça. On essayait de, de, de prendre de l'eau pour se laver les yeux. And they gave me drops to relieve my eyes. Eventually, my sight got worse and worse. And what about when it got even worse? Well, they fired me. I hope to be cured, but I put myself now in, in the hands of the Lord. Eye problems are common in the plantations. But there are other illnesses linked to the use of pesticides, according to the locals. We want to check the facts and seek more evidence. A few kilometers away, Dr. Wong is a consultant at the St. John of Malta Hospital. While he can't prove it, he's noticed a pattern between some illnesses and the pesticides. To say we have a problem, and it's linked to the pesticides is a hard thing to prove. I'm referring to eye problems. It's when, for example, a plane has passed overhead and then someone comes and says their eyes hurt. I've had patients like that. Those cases can be proved. But I have no proof that pulmonary illnesses are connected. Uh, but there are people with lung infections. But as a scientist, what's your gut feeling? Well, if anyone is exposed to pesticides for a certain time, then it's obvious their lungs will be affected. But there has to be a relationship between cause and effect. If you're exposed for long enough, you can't say there isn't. We tried to obtain some medical files from the St. John of Malta Hospital where the doctor works, but it was impossible. Maybe because it's partly financed by the very PHP that's a subsidiary of the fruit company. Something their online corporate video is keen to point out. The hospital also allows to care for the local inhabitants. Getting proof within the banana plantations is by no means easy. The number of sick people, the type and cause of illness, what we do discover, though, are people who've become social outcasts. Something's wrong with this picture. It's one of the richest regions in the country, and yet, look around. The community of Njombe Penja doesn't look as if it's profited from the riches bananas can provide. The former mayor claims he was sent to prison without passing go for having raised the issue. He'd just been elected mayor in 2007. Paul Eric Kingwea is looking for financing for Njombe Penja. There's no money in the coffers. He says the large businesses in the community hadn't paid any taxes, company or otherwise. Amongst them, largest local employer, PHP. We have a company like PHP. It makes billions. And yet it doesn't pay a penny in tax. I arrive and I tell these people, well, oh, since you've been having fun and a good time and you haven't been paying taxes, you know what, my town has no money. So now you have to start paying. Paul Eric Kingwe is immediately backed by Cameroon's fiscal administration. The director general makes it known he'll ensure the strict application of the law and then companies like PHP will have to pay taxes like everyone else. Yet two months later, on the 28th of February 2008, the mayor is arrested and accused of fermenting popular unrest in the region. A strike and demonstrations against the increasing price of fuel and foodstuffs are blamed for the outbreak of the deadly incidents. There's no evidence, so the law accuses Paul Eric Kingwe of embezzling from his own town hall. Each time there's an appeal, there's another banana skin to negotiate. Five years on, and the former mayor is still in prison. He takes advantage of a few hours' leave by talking to us. If you decide that you want to take on the company, either as mayor or as an individual, you must understand that every means has been put in place to make sure you're crushed. Off to prison, Mr. Mayor. Now, what role did PHP play in all this? Is his fate tied to the PHP case? Nothing indicates it is. Whatever the case, according to the Njombe Penja accounts, it still hasn't paid up. The fruit company, the owner of PHP, later assures us by email that it has now been paying tax since 2011, but straight to the state, not to the local community. Health problems amongst the locals and some serious back taxes to pay. 
If PHP manages to go on cultivating bananas easily, it's because it's been cultivating good relations with the Cameroonian authorities. By way of example, the offices of the local MP, Indono and Banga, are on PHP property. And incredibly, the Member of Parliament is also the Director of External Relations for the company. As we didn't get permission to film, we do what we usually do in these circumstances, which is to hide the camera and film in secret. You're an MP, you work for PHP, isn't that a combination that might intimidate some of the people around here? Because you're the MP and people will think they won't get far if they come to see their MP to complain about PHP? If people say PHP does this or PHP does that, I listen. And then I find a solution, a fair solution. It's about keeping a good neighborly relationship with the local inhabitants. And sometimes I even stand up to PHP on behalf of my constituents. Normally one might call it a conflict of interest, but the MP isn't the only one. Let's just recap. So he's the Director of External Affairs for PHP, and another MP is currently the Chairman of the Board of PHP. His predecessor also held the same post and was Minister of Commerce at the same time. People's representatives who actually work for PHP, a well-established network that extends as far as Paris. Well, who wouldn't like to play with the grown-ups? At the Elysee Palace, where the French president lives. Today, Paul Bigneau, the president of Cameroon, has come here in the guise of traveling salesman. After his meeting with President Francois Hollande and all the ceremony of state, we ask him a few questions about the links the Cameroon government has with the French banana company. Mr. President, one question, please, about bananas. We saw some serious problems, including health problems and social issues, relating to the activities of PHP, the fruit company in Cameroon. Could you explain to us why your government doesn't do anything about it? The government has a lot of problems to deal with. But to get into the details, I've brought along the Minister of the Economy. We haven't ignored these problems, and they're part of what we're trying to resolve. But there are social problems, there are health problems that have been raised down there, and yet the people are complaining that the state has done nothing for them. What can you tell them? These problems will be resolved, sir. Well, who can we talk to? A driver? A guardsman? He avoided that banana skin. Ah, how about the guy with the sunglasses? We fix an appointment for the next morning. Somewhere he can answer our questions. The Pavilion Gabriel, just a few steps from the Elysee Palace. Cameroon is being honored here and big business from France and Cameroon is gathered. A petit four in one hand and champagne in the other. A flurry of exchanging business cards. We soon spot Jean-Christophe Hidzik. He's representing the fruit company. He's part of the official delegation of Cameroon. Hello, sir. Wandril Lanos from France 2 Television. How are you? Can I ask you a couple of questions? I'd like to talk about bananas in Cameroon. I'm really quite uh, tied up, actually. Maybe I can find someone for you. But you represent the fruit company, unless I'm mistaken. I work with them, but I'm not familiar with, with all the issues. No, let me find someone for you. Uh, truth be told, it would be better to find someone else. But despite insisting, the fruit company refused to be interviewed. At a time when there are more and more labels, the guarantees, the promises that are made to us, the customers, let's keep our eyes open. And let's ask ourselves, if sustainable businesses exist, doesn't that mean that unsustainable businesses also exist? So next weekend, when we're pushing the shopping trolley between the shelves, we should stop and ask, at what price does exploitation begin?